other wings, uh, you may have a different standpoint of how mishaps are reported in your wing. So, you know, um, just bear with that. Um, this is how we do things in Maryland. Um, but there's also a chance for us to look at some of the pictures of stuff that's actually happened in the wing and kind of go over how it would be reported and what would you would say and everything. So it's going to be interactive. Um, so hopefully you guys can get some stuff out of this and, and all that stuff. So hang on one second. Let me... All right. So the agenda that we're going to go through, we're going to kind of go over what is the definition of a mishap, the mishap reporting requirements. Uh, believe it or not, I have a whole bunch of photos. So this is where you're going to be able to see some stuff. Um, what happens when you do have a mishap? And then just to go over some review and questions. All right, so the definition of mishap. So the mishap definition and mishap reporting definitions are in CAPR 160-2. That's the new, uh, it's a change from 60-1 that you that everybody remembers, but this is the new one. It just simply says that anytime you damage, hurt, or could injure anybody, that it's got to be reported. Um, it, it comes down to an extent of if you damage metal or you injure somebody and it's bad enough, it's a mishap. Let us know. We'll take care of it from that side. All right. So beyond that, there's actually the reporting requirements. Uh, so if you find damage or you were involved in a mishap per 160-2, you're supposed to actually start the mishap reporting requirements. Now, each region actually has their own internal reporting requirements. Um, so you notify the proper channels. Um, there actually is a region supplement. Um, and then each wing can have their own requirement beneath that. Um, so I'm going to really quick go over what we do in Maryland wing. And that is if a mishap occurs, first notify the activity director or the commander of the event that the mishap occurred. This would be if you're on a SARX, notify the incident commander. Um, after that, please notify the wing director of safety or the designee, i.e. I have two assistants beneath me, um, our direct assistant director of safety for the air and our ground side, which is also our health services officer. Um, and then we will sit there and notify the wing commander uh, or his designee that a mishap has occurred. And the wing commander will notify the region and the NOC if needed. Uh, the NOC is the National Operations Center. Um, typically that's if we have a major incident um, such as a death, serious injury, like, I mean, we're talking serious injury, or um, we've had an aircraft accident. Um, I know that the NOC was notified in the last week because of an incident in California, um, uh, an aircraft accident that happened with CAP. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that we have to take care of on that side. All right. So this is where we're going to get interactive for a few minutes. So the next few slides are pictures from actual Maryland wing mishaps. A bunch of these are old. Um, and then I kind of want to find out if you guys, if you guys came across a, in, in any kind of these scenarios, would you report it and what would you say? So we'll go ahead and start that. So here's the first one. You don't all have to chime in at the same time. You guys know what you're looking at. <laughs> That's a good question. I would say yes, that you would report this. All right. So let, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, this was actually a prop strike uh, that happened at the end of the runway when they hit the runway light. Hmm. The center picture that you see in the middle is actually the runway light itself. And this is the damage to the prop uh, on the front side and on the back side. So you can see, you know, where it is. OK. Yes. And it is definitely a mishap, and it was reported that way and everything else. So mm -hmm. this is this is the kind of stuff that we don't want to see. We want to know about right after it happens, not later, <laughs> which has happened. All right. So we'll go to the we clicked on the wrong page. All right, what about this one? Definitely report. Like a no-brainer. Definitely <laughs> report. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, believe it or not, this was not caused by us. 
This is was a tug that was towing a helicopter impacted our aircraft. So there was nobody around our aircraft when this happened except the tug that was towing an air, another airplane. But it still had to be reported by us. So what uh, happens when a situation like this occurs and you're not in your state or at your airport? Uh, what would happen? Does CAP find um, help for you to get home? Typically, uh, from my understanding, is yes. Um, if it happens and in your, you're out of state, we'll, I think most of the time we'll try to figure out a way to, for you to get home. Um, luckily enough, none of our aircraft have ever been damaged or vehicles have been damaged outside of our state. And I knock on wood on that. <laughs> All right. So here's the next one. Yes, you reported there's obviously metal damage and it looks like maybe a vehicle collision, so it would have been reported anyway. Believe it or not, this one took 24 hours before we even found out about it. Was that parked overnight or something? Can you elaborate? Um, if I remember this one exactly, this is a case where a it was parked next to another vehicle and the other vehicle damaged our vehicle. Um, and it was in a parking lot. I don't know what parking lot it was. I can't remember that. Um, but it was simply impacted. And this is obviously on the passenger side. So when the driver got back in, he didn't necessarily notice it until the next time he got in the, in the vehicle. So it's just something to remember that if you're driving any of the vehicles is to do a quick walk around and make sure that everything's okay with the vehicle before you go anywhere. All right. What about this one? That would be a yes, wouldn't it? It certainly it would. Yes. Any any of our prop strikes or potential prop damage uh, actually is needs to be notified pretty quickly because we actually have to tear down the engine per the regulations uh, to make sure there is no internal damage. Um, so this is one of the this act. Uh, I think this is from a flight training incident. Um, the student pilot purposed the airplane um, and struck the runway. What's a porpoise? Um, the best way I can describe it is they they landed, bounced, and landed again. It's kind of like an arch down the runway. So they kind of bounced it down the runway is the be another way to think of it all right what about this one it looks like we porpoised it but yes reported so this is a recent mishap this is actually a tail one strike that's this is the tail strike. So I, I, I put this in there because these are the pictures that were initially sent that were initially sent to us, and it's hard to tell that there's damage. And then there's other pictures that we got later that you can see scrapes up and down the rudder too. So it was a pretty hard tail strike. Um, and. The reason I bring this up is because if you're looking around the airplane, how easily noticeable is this damage? It's not, it's hidden. Uh, yep. And that's why I wanted to bring it up because you can have hidden damage like this that you even, even if you don't realize that you did it, you can still have hidden damage like this. So this is one of the ones that's more important to make sure that we report it as soon as possible. Now, not all the time do we have damage to our stuff. We damage other people. Is this reportable? What's well, a Ford? Absolutely. It might have just. 
So believe it or not, we backed into this car. A CAP vehicle backed into this car and did that damage. Hmm. So technically it's reportable because it involved our vehicle. Although most of the damage happened to their vehicle. Still has to be reported. It's one of those odd ones that everybody kind of looks at and goes like, well, it's not our vehicle. Yeah, still, it has to be reported. I forget when this was. This was a snowstorm and everything else. And there was a lot of nuances with being able to see cars parked around snowbanks. goes to make sure you have a clear line of sight. What about this one? Windshields out. And you said metal on metal, but that's obvious damage, so I'm going to say absolutely needs to be reported. Yep. Like a girl. This mishap actually is the more famous one within the wing. This is the uh, the three aircraft that were on the J line at Martin that were take, take, taken out. That we we weren't the cause of this. A uh, private pilot was doing an engine run up and lost control of the airplane and hit all three of ours. <clears throat> so this this was significant damage to our aircraft, but we were not at fault. Are you going to share photos of the other aircraft of ours that were damaged? I have them. Um, some of the reason I didn't put some of those photos in here is because I, I purposely tried to pick photos that didn't have any of the aircraft tail numbers or any identifying marks on them. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, our our plane was demolished on the J line, so I was just curious if it was coming up. Yeah, and it, it's it that's it, it. Yeah, it's from that same set. <laughs> that's that's there, what I there's a, there's I, a, a, I asked. There's about twenty five pictures in the system from that accident, from that mishap. Our plane was out for about two years because of that mishap. All right, so this next one. It's still a prop strike, so yes. So believe it or not, this one is, is this is a current prop strike that's under that just wrapped up its mishap review, um, and was found during a pre-flight. Ooh. So that means the previous crew didn't report the damage. And it was fixed, supposedly fixed without any other information happening to it. This is not a good one. But it's hard to tell where it hit, you know, what hit it and or where we hit something. But you can obviously tell we did. It is a prop strike. So. As an observer or scanner, um, if you're walking around the plane with the pilot and they choose not to acknowledge that, what should you do? Um, you can always question the pilot um, if you think it truly is a, is a safety consideration. Um, and I, I mean, there's a lot of personal decision that goes in that. But if you truly feel like there's something that they missed and it's a real safety consideration, that needs to be addressed and reported. And, and every crew member has the authority to sit there and say, knock it off. That's always been a standard at any point. What about this one? Yes, it's a missing window. <laughs> so believe it or not, we don't actually know how this happened, but it was just a random window that broke. <laughs> it could be the temperature, could you know, this this is just one of those things that they came out to the vehicle and the window broke. <laughs> Or they could have just slammed the door really hard and it broke. It, it, it's That's always hard to tell. But we had a window break. 
All right. What about this one? It's like somebody backed up into something. So yes. They uh, the 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 van in this picture backed into a fire hydrant. Yeah, that, I, I didn't want to say it, but that's exactly what it looked like. Did it hurt the fire hydrant? Uh, I don't have pictures of the fire hydrant, unfortunately. But the the one thing that, that has shown up in a lot of our vehicle mishaps is that we we have a lot of backing out mishaps where people aren't paying attention to where they're where the vehicle's going. The vans are longer than personal vehicles. They're bigger and their turning radius isn't the same. And that's something that is. And if you don't have a spotter, which you should, you can't tell. So that, that's that's a harder thing to deal with. Well, to that end, it's simple enough to get a cone out. And as soon as you tip the cone, you know you've gone as far as you can go. Yep. So th these two are kind of harder to tell, but and it I, I don't remember how we determined what happened out of this one, but this is just, you know, probably some wear and tear on the rudder. But obviously it, it's damaged part of the rudder. So you'd want to have it looked at just to make sure that it's still flyable. Because that's the other thing, especially with all the aircraft services, you don't want to, if you find any damage, you want to make sure that it's still flyable before you do anything else. All right. What about this one? Yes, wing damage. It is a wing damage. I think this is from a bird strike. We did have, we've had one or two bird strikes in, in the wing. Um, they're not as common as everybody thinks they are, but they happen. Um, all right. What about this one? Yes. Yes. All right. Believe it or not, this one we hit the tops of the trees. Uh, this was an incident where the plane was low enough at a land at a at an airport in Maryland where they struck the top of a pine tree, and the green that you see in all the pictures is actually the is residue from the tree. Was this a small, hard to get into airport? It is one of the. We have a couple of airports in the wing that I deem are that, from my standpoint are very difficult to fly into. Is this right next to a major highway? It is. Mm. If you want to know the airport, it's freeway. That's what I was thinking. <clears throat> freeway has a very unique pattern to it. Its power lines are on the one side, so you can't do typical traffic pattern work. It's narrow. It's non-standard. It's uphill when you're landing towards the 50, so it's it's got a lot of visual illusions that <clears throat> can throw you off. All right, so hmm. I'm throwing this one in there for a loophole for you guys. <laughs> so is that cap property? So here's the context. This is a damaged cone clearly sitting on the edge of a runway next to a CAP flight line. This is actually the evidence of a prop strike. Oh, I did hear about that. OK, this actually ended up having to have the engine tear down just because we struck a cone. Hmm. And that is the aftermath of the cone. <laughs> Um, and the pilot uh, at the time, they didn't realize they actually hit the cone, so they they had we had to stop them eventually on the other side. So that's this is the only evidence on the on the striking side that we had of where the prop hit. 
So again, it, it's one of those things that, you know, sometimes we don't have the evidence of the prop strike, sometimes we do. Other times it's just what's on the prop itself. And in this case, I don't think there was any evidence on the prop that we struck something. But we had pictures of this and we had witnesses that saw it hit the hit the cone. All right. What about this one? It's damage. But it also appears to be on a personal vehicle. It is. It's actually uh, um, happened um, trying to back out of a parking spot for one of our vans and sideswipe the truck. Did significant damage to this truck, though. Because it's one of our larger va vans and did some damage. All right. So that's all the photos. But now you got to go into. So you. You've witnessed something, you've seen damage like that. What do you do? What happens? What's the next steps? Well, believe it or not, there's a whole host of things that go into when you have a mishap. So if you find damage or you observe a mishap, you should follow the Maryland Wing Mishap Reporting Guidelines, notify all of us in the proper chain. Depending on what we tell you, um, if you call me uh, personally, you know, we'll start doing all the process, but, you know, first I'll ask to make sure that everybody's okay um, and all that stuff. And then after that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start going through the actual Sears steps. So um, the safety information reporting system is where you enter all the information in, in for a mishap. And it's, it, it's heavily involved, but you got to make sure you put in the right information. So the reason that we ask that you kind of talk to somebody like me before you put anything in there is because I want to make sure that it's the right information that we have at the right time and that we're not trying to you know, put in something that doesn't make sense or won't or could cause problems. Um, it's also a way because that way we don't have, um, depending on the mishap, if you put it in Sears, it sends an email to a lot of people up the chain all the way to national headquarters. And in the past, I have gotten phone calls from the national chief, from the chief of safety at national headquarters asking me about a mishap that I had no idea happened other than an email came through. So I had no information about it at all and I was caught off guard. Um, and that doesn't look good and I don't, that's not something that I really want to be aware of. That way I can help anybody trying to put the mishap in the system, understand what they have to do and understand the process. So you, you complete step one. So step one is where you put the initial impact of the, of the mishap in the system and you kind of explain when it happened, what day, here's what happened. It'd be like prop strike at this airport, you know, this information. You don't put any personal information in there. You don't put any names, phone numbers, none of that gets put in there. It sends an email to the entire chain of command. We all are aware of it. Then you have to go back into Sears and complete step two. So once you've gathered enough information, you go back into Sears, you complete step two. Step two pretty much says, okay, you add the vehicle information, the aircraft information, the any of the people that were witnesses or part of the mishap, they all get put in. And then that's where it comes back up to us. And at the wing, we can now assign a mishap review officer. And then at the end of that, the mishap review officer conducts a mishap review and you'll be notified, you know, by them if they're going to interview you or talk to you and all that stuff. And that's just how we how it's done. Once the mishap review officer conducts the review, it comes back to the wing and we we go through a corrective action plan to figure out how to prevent the mishap from happening again. Um, this past fiscal year in 2020, we had six mishaps in in the wing. Five of them were aircraft mishaps. Um, our mishap rate has increased dramatically over the last fiscal year, and it's not good. <laughs> so we're we're trying to focus at the wing level on preventing those from happening again, and it's just a lot of work in that time. Any questions so far? We have a question in the chat um, asking how to contact you. Um, so 
individually, if if you guys want to contact me for any questions, you can reach out to my email, which is mcawthon at cap.gov. Um, or if you want, you can give me a call. I'll, I'll answer your calls. Um, please don't call me really late at night <laughs> unless it's an emergency. <laughs> um, but my phone number is 301-525-4629. Um, and then the other part of it is um, if you – when you have a mishap, I can't post anything. We're, we're trying to figure out a solution to the, to the, is there something in the vehicle of the aircraft that would have our contact numbers on it? And that's a problem right now. There actually is not. Um, the current rule has a, states that we can't have any PII information in there. Um, so that's why we've had to reduce it down to just the rank, who the duty assignment is assigned to. And that's been a problem. Um, so that's something that both at the wing level and at region, we're trying to figure out a solution to. I know how a couple other wings are doing it. I like how they do it. It's just the problem of getting it done. All right, so we'll go on to the next slide really quick. All right, so just to wrap up in a quick review um, is what is a mishap? A mishap is obviously any time that we have damage, uh, observed damage, or we injure somebody. Um, when, you should, when should you report it? You want to report it as soon as possible to the right people. Uh, don't immediately try to just put something in Sears. It, if you, you, know, you get some guidance on doing that. Uh, we went through a bunch of examples. I hope you guys like some of the pictures. I have tons and tons more pictures. I just have to be careful what I show. Um, and then we just went over what happens when you have a mishap. Um, bottom line is, you know, when you have a mishap, it's not meant to be, oh my God, and I'm going to be in trouble and all that stuff. From a pure safety standpoint, we just want to make sure that everybody's okay. Um, <clears throat> and that, you know, that everything's taken care of for that immediate right after the mishap and then you know we'll deal with the mishap review and what happens and all that stuff to see what we can do to prevent it from happening again um safety is not about assigning blame in any of the mishaps we don't want to do that it's mainly just to make sure that we we can learn from it and move on and, and have an, an understanding so i'll open it to questions um or if you guys want to just chat with me for a few minutes and uh, I mean, I'm I'm here for the next couple for about the next 20 minutes anyway. Um, so feel free to ask me questions about other stuff in safety that I may be able to answer for you. Just one comment: if everyone um, would take a look at the chat above, if you need conference attend um, attendance credit uh, to complete the survey that's provided there in the chat. John, I, I, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, um, <clears> this <throat> still is on the topic of safety, um, you know, for one of your uh, prop strikes, but forgive my ignorance because I'm just a, uh, an army grunt and I don't know anything about planes, really. Why? I, I know you said for safety and for inspecting further damage, but is does a prop strike throw off calibration of the engine so much that it can mess things up? I mean, I, I don't understand the mechanics. Um, so the basic mechanics of it is because you're hitting um, a prop is technically like a small um, aerofoil that's in that's moving at a high rate of speed. So it's it, it's a spinning wing in a in a sense. And if you damage any portion of that airfoil, it can cause problems in, in airflow over that portion of the propeller that helps generate some of the power behind it. And it's like you don't want – you have anti-icing systems on, on certain features, and that's kind of the same, same point. Um, and it's just the way that, that everything flows rightly. When you have a prop strike – you're kind of suddenly hitting something really hard really fast. 
and it can damage not only the blade, but it can also damage other components. And you kind of have to, and by CAP regulation, we actually have to tear down the engine um, just to make sure that it's okay. Okay. So it's, it's like not, when an Abrams tank sucks a rock or something through the turbine. It, it does the same kind of damage then. In a very similar way, that's probably another way to put it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it can do some damage internally. You just don't know until you actually, you know, take it all apart to see. Okay. What would be some examples of um, a mishap that wouldn't require Sears reporting something so minor? I mean, um, I, I guess maybe first, uh, like general first aid or, or, well, that would be under the first aid section of the of yeah, Sears, so I guess. So, so Doug, you're, 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 you're right on that. So first aid, if it's something that, if it can be handled by a Band-Aid, is probably the best way to put it. Um, paper cuts don't need to be reported. Um, that kind of stuff, minor first aid. <clears throat> if you have a cadet pass out, that should be reported because chances are you don't know why he passed out. Um, they could say, oh, well, I didn't have enough to drink. Well, that, that could be part of it, but they could have also locked their knees. So there, there's a whole bunch to it. Um, encampment. Generally, our encampments have about 25 mishaps per year. Um, this year, because we didn't actually have any encampments, this is why my mishap numbers are so off this year. This is we didn't have anything. <laughs> we didn't do any any cadet activities. So I have no bodily injuries to, to uh, in the mishap this year. Um, I have one that's currently under review, and that's that's a bit that's a bigger one. Um, but most of the other ones have all been vehicle or aircraft. Does that answer your question, Doug? Kind of an example. Absolutely. And also, would like um, anything with a greater monetary value ratios and so forth be included in there? Yeah, so um, that that's pretty that's that's the other thing. If it's if it's substantial damage, like i.e. going to cost a lot of money to fix, it falls into that category. Um, you may have noticed that one of the pictures that is not included in this slideshow is the one from the runway accident. Um, I have not included any pictures from that because most people have already seen that aircraft. But and that one was damaged pretty badly. So, you know, there's no need to, you know, talk about that one because it's pretty obvious what happened to it from a pure physical standpoint. Understood. Thanks. Olivia? Can you do an overview of the expectation for the risk assessment worksheets? Um, I know mine have been very basic. I just want to confirm that I'm doing what you expect. So, okay. So the CAP Form 160. Um, I figured this question might come up. Um, the the basic information that you guys the the reason that you know i've been asking all the squadron safety officers and everybody to do that on a basis of when they have their meetings and everything is so that you guys get familiar with doing it um pretty much most of everybody's been doing it okay i mean i i haven't reviewed every single one of them um because it's a lot to review believe it or not um but the biggest thing that you just need to make sure of is that you are consistently understanding that you look back at it. That's probably the biggest thing that you have to do. So as you do the 160 and you complete the activity, go back and look at it. Did it, did it work? Did every control that you have work? Or did we need to modify the control and put a new one in? 
that's the biggest expectation but that that's not on me that's actually on you guys as, as squadrons and 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 members to do that on your own um and if it doesn't work or you have questions then you can you know, reach out and ask the questions and i'll see what i can do um and, and hopefully that understands some parts of it um Um, so hopefully, you know, if you have any other questions about it, you, you know, you can always let me know. Um, and I'll be more than happy to, to share with you, with you what I can, what I can do. But, um, I think on average, I have like four or five of them in <laughs> at a time that I, I don't always get a chance to review every single one of them. Is there a more specific question that you want, Olivia, that I that I may be able to help you with on it? No, um, I, I was just wanting to be sure that I was doing what I was supposed to be doing effectively. And I assumed, and I hate doing that. Um, <laughs> yeah, what, what does assuming do? Um, I, I assumed if I was not doing them correctly that somebody would have said something at this point. But I figured um, now may be a good time if... You know, somebody else had a question or something, but to my standpoint, um, yes, you did answer the question, and I, I'm confident that I'm I'm doing what the expectation is. Yeah, and 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 and, and if I ever find something that you know is is grossly out of whack, I'll let you guys, I'll let most everybody know. Um, but it's also a learning opportunity for all of you guys, you know, to keep trying it and, and everything else because it. It, it's the bigger events are the ones that I have to actually review. So any of the wing events I review, <laughs> um, it, it's at the squadron level to do all the other stuff. I'm just merely looking at them just so I can have a chance to, you know, help you guys with all the, all of it and make sure it's, you're heading in the right direction. And I've not seen anything that's grossly out of whack. <laughs> if, if that's the bigger answer, you know, I've not seen any of those issues. Perfect. Thank you. And I just reposted the survey in case you guys look for it. Any other questions or? Or comments or? Okay. Um, I can tell you anybody that was um, that is in the safety specialty track. Um, it will be changing. Um, more information will be coming out hopefully by the end of the end of November, but the new specialty track has been completely drafted and rechanged. So. Um, there's major changes coming to that. Do you know what has changed, for instance? No MSO. Oh. Wow. The MSO requirement has been removed. That means I'm Thank done. You. <laughs> After all Thank these you so years. Like After almost four years. Sometime this year. So, so I, 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 one of my goals for next year this is for anybody that's in the wing in Maryland wing, um is that um we'll actually have two two or three new master rated safety officers in the wing um come by the time the end of the year because we have to go through all the process of completing the NSOC stuff um paperwork but uh colonel trick will be a master rated safety officer and uh, Steve Lang uh, from Esperanza will be a master rated safety officer and Les Carter uh, will be hopefully be a master rated safety officer. Um, my goal is to use them to start reducing the backlog of Maryland wing members that are stuck <laughs> in tech or senior rating and start moving them through. 
Um, but yes, the master rating for the master rating and safety, the MSO requirement has been removed. We've removed a lot of other things. We've changed up a whole chunk of it. It was completely rewritten from the uh, from the ground up. And that was something that we that we decided to do uh, a, a long time ago. Um, so the safety officer college. Um, so this past uh, the, up until about oh November fourth, so ten days ago, <laughs> I spent twelve weeks um, along with 175 other people um, to to get there to complete the NSOC for the year. Um, and we are, we all graduated uh, on, on the 4th of November, um, completed 12 weeks of training. Um, the NSOC was pretty much this year was all the region directors of safety and all 50 or 51 wing directors of safety were also there. Um, and a bunch of other people, um, so the good news is that next year we'll have they'll have another NSOC in sometime in 21. Um, don't know the dates and everything, but it'll probably be a virtual combination of that. Um, and hopefully that'll be that'll be easier for everybody to get into. Yeah, it'll be online. Um, the good news is that I can tell you from from a peer standpoint that the way NSOC is going to work, um, they're trying to keep a channel open for all of us that um, are, I want to say, the the first alumni of the new NSOC, um, and hopefully become better mentors across the board for everybody in the new system. Um, so that's the the overall goal. Um, and I can also tell you that um, they're going to try to do, once everything gets set up and everything, there'll probably be region stuff that'll be happening at some point down the road. So maybe not next year, maybe in 22 or 23, we may have a region kind of NSOC that'll be able to be done in the region. So, but I like the Albuquerque. I know, Kai. I did too when I went. I feel like that was years ago now. <laughs> yes, it was. Um, because Kai, you, I think, were in the 2015 one. Yeah, I believe that was the last one to be held at Kirtland Air Force Base, and I was at the 2012 one, which was the first. Uh, one at Kirtland. And we've now gone to a online based version of it. So. Um, but uh, Olivia and, and to anybody that's in the wing, you know, if uh, once the new safety, once the new track is late is rolled out. Uh, I'll be kind of emailing everybody and trying to check, figure out if all the safety officers where they are. And get everybody back up to speed. John? Um, mentors for the safety track will have to go through uh, the university? No. Oh, okay. John, go ahead. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Along with the, the, the um, tech ratings changing, which is wonderful, um, I heard also it's going to be like the, the modules too. It's going to be all online, no more this paper scanning and stuff. Is that true? Um, I don't know to what extent yet. Um, I know that if you're going for your master rating, you still have to submit all the paperwork. Um, and that's because that's the only way that George and, and everybody at the national level can check everything. Um, that's currently one of the things I'm working on. 
is a way to check all that stuff. Because I'm one of the ones that reviews everybody's master rating package. And yeah, it's a lot of paperwork. I think hopefully the goal is to eventually get it to be where it'd be similar to what a, the SQTRs are which is the ultimate goal, but I don't know when that's going to ever happen. I, that's that's a long-range idea right now. Well, I, I heard it was supposed to be more like the modules, like the PD modules. <coughs> e either one is better than what exists. The, the modules that are coming are going to be, there's going to be tests that you have to complete at each portion, and they'll be on access. So the quizzes and all that stuff will be in access. That's what's going to happen. I think that that's what everybody's trying to get in the system now. So. Uh, Olivia, what rating do you have right now? Tech, I'm sitting on my um, senior pending the MSO situation. Um. Like all my seniors done, I just can't get him. So, so the good news is that with the new one, you might be able to get your senior rating rather quickly once it comes live. Okay, that's fair. So, because they're not grandfathering anybody in, but since you've already completed everything else for senior, and you're only waiting on that, you'll probably be, we'll probably be able to get it faster under the new system. Okay. Because then you don't have to worry about ICS 300 and all that stuff. That was one of the reasons we removed it. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, that will speed things up. Yeah, well, ICS 300 now requires six months of using that before you can do 400. Oh, why? FEMA. Good thing I, I got that done already. That's what happened. Steve? Steve, you sound like a chipmunk. You want to type you want to type your question in no it's still coming still coming across as All right, um, so I know that we reposted the survey. Um, I, I, I want to thank you guys for, you know, uh, listening to the presentation about all this stuff and and thank you for the, the questions and everything. And if you guys have any other questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I'll do my best, so. <laughs>